All right, as you can see, we have sermon notes today. And it may look like to you like it's a song, a worship song. In fact, one we did this morning. Uh, so the reason we're doing this, and this is the first time I've ever done a message on a worship song. And the reason I'm doing it is because I have a microphone and you don't. So you don't have a lot of choice except to listen. But this, is a, this song is probably in the last year... Yeah, it's always hard to define what's your favorite song. You know, what's your favorite worship song? But I think for the last year, this has been my probably favorite worship song because there's just so much scripture in it. And it's like when you are singing it, if you begin to think about it, it's, it's, you're really making a declaration. And it's, it's so important. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go through this kind of line by line. I'm going to give you some different scriptures over a lot of it. And you can write the scriptures down if you'd like. Uh, I'll give you the address to them. And then at the end, we're going to have the worship team come back up. And then we're going to do the song. We're going to worship again. As a declaration. And as again, as, as a, you know, it's kind of like when we do communion. We do communion we're doing it to remember the Lord's sacrifice of his body, of the blood, what that means. And it's the same way, actually, with this song. It's reminding us not just of what happened there, but it's about our future, the glorious future that we have, the glorious hope. So let's start. I'm going to, I kind of just remember these myself as questions. Okay, so the first line says, do you feel the world is broken? Obviously, I think most of us would agree that the world is broken. All you have to do is watch uh, the news, whether it's the local news or the world news. You see what's happening uh, In Israel, you see what's happening in Ukraine. You see what's happening across the world. You see the uh, the darkness that's going on, the crime that's increasing, all those things. And so we we all recognize, yes, the world is broken. Now the second line says, "Do you feel the shadows deepening?" Another way to say that would be, "Do you feel the darkness?" is getting darker. And again, I think if you think about, especially for some of us who are my age or older, you can look back and see how much the darkness has increased. There are things that when I was young, I'm 74 now, that, say, transgenderism, I would have never even entered my mind, would never even thought about it. And we see the, the different darkness in all the areas of the culture. And so we, we would all have to recognize and say, yes, we do see, feel that the shadows are getting deeper, or the darkness is getting darker. The third line says, but do you know that all that dark won't stop the light from getting in? Or getting through. And so I think of uh, the scripture, John 8, 12. Jesus says that this is where the rich young ruler was coming up to him. He said, good teacher. And the, and, and the Lord says, I am, I'll take it back. I am the light of this world. So Jesus says, I am the light. He is the one who gives us hope. The fourth line. So you wish that you could see it all made new. I mean, as we recognize the shape the world is in, as we see the direction it's going, then there should be probably a cry within our heart to say, yes, we, we long to see it all made new. And I think of the scripture, Revelation uh, 21, verse 5. He says, I am making 
all things new. So that's the answer to that question. Do we want to see it? Yes, there will be a day when he makes all things new. The fifth line And I want to read a scripture out of Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. Well, actually, I'm going to go to verse 18, I think. 18 through 22, Romans 8. Paul writing, he says, I consider that our present suffering are not compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. The creation awaits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from the bondage of decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Verse 22. We know that all of creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. So if you think about even creation, we're talking, you know, we were talking earlier about our, the human part of, of sin and the darkness. But look at creation itself. We are under the the curse of the fall. And a result of that is we might look at creation and say, you know, some of the, there's certain species of trees that can live hundreds of years. But eventually they decay and they die. And that's true of all of of creation. It's under that, that curse of the fall. So because of that, line six says, is a new creation coming? Is a new creation coming? Okay, Revelations 21 and verse 1 and 2, I'll just paraphrase it for you. It says, then I saw, this is John, Apostle John saying, then I saw a new heavens and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. So is a new creation coming? It is. And again, that's part of our hope, future hope. Even in the increasing darkness, there is a day coming when there will be a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth. Then the seventh question, is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Revelation 22 and verse 5. It says they will need no light or sun, for the Lord will be the light. So there will be no need of any artificial light. There will not be a need of a moon or a sun. It's the Lord Himself will light everything. And then verse 8, it says, is it good, again, that we remind ourselves of this? And again, I go back to to taking communion or taking the Lord's Supper. We do that to remind ourselves of certain things, right? Christ's body being broken, his blood being shed. But in this, we're talking about not only that, we're talking about what is the future that you and I have. 
no matter how the darkness continues to come, no matter how bad things may see here on earth, that we have a glorious future. And that's why as Christians, we have to have that hope within us. You know, I've often heard it said that don't lose in the darkness what you found in the light. In other words, there are going to be, Jesus promised, it said, in this life you will have tribulation, you will have tri- in the midst, but take heart, I have overcome. But sometimes when you're in the midst of that battle, and you're in the midst of that place of darkness, where you're being challenged, we have to remind ourselves again that hope is coming. Now, we are all under a stage of decay. I can look in the mirror and say, I don't look the same. And that's part of life. You know, that's part of the life cycle. But we have a hope of eternal life, and we get a new body, a body that will never again fail us, be sick, will be glorious, he will wipe away every tear, And we have to continue to remind ourselves of that hope that is yet in the future. Question nine. Is anyone worthy? Now, most of us would would say right off the top, yes, we know that only Jesus is worthy, right? But then it asks, is anyone whole? Now think of that from, about that for a second. So we, you, and I are all broken. We're all broken vessels. Now hopefully we are, as we grow in maturity, as we grow in sanctification, we are becoming more and more like Christ. But we will not ever reach that in this life. So until we leave this body, or until Jesus comes again, we're in a, a stage where we are not whole. Now in Luke chapter 18, we we'll look at a couple different scripture. And it says that this is where actually where the the, uh, rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, good teacher, what must I do? We say, and Jesus said, what do you call me good? He said, there is only one, there is no one good except God alone. There's no one perfect except God alone. And then in John 14, 30, Jesus is talking about, he says, the prince of the world is coming. In other words, Satan. But he says, he has no hold on me. I mean, in other words, there was no hook, there was no darkness that Satan could ex- exploit in Jesus. We can't say that because, again, we are in a process. Hopefully, we are being transformed. Hopefully, we are working out our salvation in fear and trembling, and we are growing in maturity, and we are not like we were a year ago or five years ago or ten years ago, that we are progressively being being shaped and molded into that image of Jesus. But again, we are not going to reach that in this life. Now, these next three lines I'm going to take together. And it says, is is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? And then it makes a statement And it says, the Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. And then the next line says, he was David's root and the lamb who died 
to ransom the slave. So I want to go to Revelations chapter 5. Revelations chapter 5. And we're going to look at the first uh, five verses. It said, Then I saw the right hand of him who was sitting on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So there's a scroll. It's sealed with seven seals. Basically, how many all the end time information of what's coming. And he asked, is anyone able to open it? And no one in heaven nor in earth was worthy except the Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. And think about, you know, Jesus being the lamb, obviously the sacrificial lamb that laid down his life on our behalf. But now he is shown as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He will, be, he will not be coming like a lamb. He will be coming like a ruler. He will come to take dominion and to rule and to reign. At least on my list is number 13. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessings and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? Okay, that same chapter, Revelations 5, we're going to look at verse 9 through 10. And it says, each one had a harp and were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, so they will reign on the earth. So yes, he is worthy of all blessings and glory and honor. And is he worthy of this? Yes, he is worthy of all that praise and all the honor. All right, next line on my list is 14. And it says, does the Father truly love us? And I just think of probably the first verse that you ever memorized was probably John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So yes, the Father truly loves us. Number 15 question, does the Spirit move among us? So I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse 4 through 11. And Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one as he determines. So those gifts of the Spirit that work within us has given to each one of us some type of gift, one of those gifts. And that's how we know, yes, the Spirit moves among us. Next question. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? So the question again, does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? I got two different scriptures. John chapter 10. Look at that first. Verse 27 through 29. Verse 27 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me, and he is greater than all. No one can search, can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So no one can take you out beside yourself. No one can come between you and the love of the Father. The other one would be Romans chapter 8. Remember Romans 8. And we're going to look at verses 35 through 39. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Know in all these things, 
we are more than conquerors than through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So there's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ Jesus. Though every man be found a liar, he is faithful, and he will always remain faithful. Question 17, does our God intend to dwell with again with us? Revelations 21, 3 and 4, again, does our God intend to dwell with us again? Chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. As I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with him. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. So the Father and the Son, with the Spirit, the Godhead, will dwell with us physically together. Now, which, again, death will be done away with. Every tear will be wiped away, and we will be in the presence of the glory of God. Now, the next couple, I'm just kind of, I put it as additional, 18, 19. Because it says, from every people and tribe, every nation and every tongue, So in Revelation 14, verse 6, and he had an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation every tribe, every language, and every people. Now, the last one says, He has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. 1 Peter 2.9 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. And it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may be a ho- the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So thank you, God. That he has made you and I a kingdom of priests. 
to minister to the Lord through prayer, through worship. We are called as his vessels. And that we will reign with the Son. We will rule and reign. We will be co-laborers with him. We will each have a position, a job, a function in heaven. We're not going to be sitting in heaven playing a harp. We're going to have things to do, creative things to do. But we will be living in a perfect world where sin is no more, where we have been purified, all our hearts, minds, and then we are more and more, again, in that image of Jesus. So it's a glorious future. That's why we need to continually remind ourselves of that. That, yes, the world is getting darker. Things are going to get worse. They're not going to get better. Things are going to get worse. But for us as Christians, we have that eternal hope. And that's one thing you never want to lose is hope. Hope for the future, hope of what is coming yet, hope of what we're going to see. And that faith, knowing that we will one day see that ourselves. Whether we go to to be with the Lord through death or whether the Lord comes in our lifetime, the same, we have the same results. So I'm going to go ahead and have the worship team, if you guys can come back up. What we're going to do... So I'm going to do that song again. You've gone through it. You've looked at the different scriptures. You see that how it is, it is really a declaration. It's a declaration of hope. It's a declaration of our future, our inheritance. That's our inheritance, folks. You and I have a glorious inheritance in front of us. So we're making a declaration. We are also reminding ourselves of this, of the glory that is yet before us. And we also, because sometimes we have this issue, we need to get that song from our heads down to our hearts. Sometimes that's the, the longest distance, getting things... Yeah, we, we have a head knowledge, but it's not going down and it's not touching us in our inner man, in our spirit. And so that's what we want to do. So if you don't get it the first time, then we'll do the song again <laughs> until you get it, okay? So let's go ahead and those of you who can stand, go ahead and stand. And we're going to enter into this time of, you know, Jesus said that those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we want to do that now. We want to enter into this place where we truly enter in spirit and truth, knowing that he's going to meet us. He's going to meet you. Put your focus upon him.